This video was sponsored by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. This video was also brought to you by my premium tutorials on Gumroad. If you'd like to watch my longer form videos, you can do so by purchasing them at gumroad.com slash modern day James. This month I'll be starting a new series which is going to be on creating illustrations with a narrative focus. Before we get into the video, I just want to suggest that you go back and watch the first part if you haven't done so already. The reason being is that we're going to use a lot of concepts that we covered already, and uh, I'm going to glance over them a bit here. As far as the rest of the videos, you should be able to watch those in any particular order. So with that being said, let's get started drawing some hands. The way I rationalize the forms of the hands is usually through a very simplified construction. In this model, I'm just simplifying the hand as well as the forearm into a rectangular prism and the wrist to a cylinder. The goal here is not to make a pretty drawing of a hand just yet, but to understand how much of each side and plane we're going to see at a particular time. As I turn this more into a side view, you can see that the back of the hand begins to foreshorten, and we see more of the width of the hand. You can also devise your own form breakdowns that are a little more intricate once you're comfortable with those basic forms. Simplifying the anatomy down into planes is really helpful for figuring out how this fits in perspective, as well as establishing values for each side. For example, in the first hand, I'm grouping all of the fingers together as one solid mass of value. You'll notice that there's this drop at the wrist because the hand rests lower than the forearm. This is a really important detail to be aware of because without it, the hands look too linear and they look as though they can't pivot around the bones of the forearm. When the hand is oriented directly at the camera, that's when you're going to get the most foreshortening. Anything foreshortened is typically pretty difficult to draw, but just remember that all of the sides and forms that are closest to you are going to overlap those that are behind them. It's also a situation in which parallel lines are really going to converge fast to a vanishing point. That's why we're not seeing too much of the backside of either of these last two hands. Proportionally, the palm of the hand is very square, although it tends to be a bit longer than it is wide. The fingers are about three quarters of the length of the palm. But all these proportions are subject to change based on anatomical variation, and they're proportions that you can play around with. The thumb side of the hand also protrudes more than the pinky side. Let's take a look at the underlying bones here. The wrist is made up of the ulna and radius. These are the two bones that make up the forearm, with the radius being at the thumb side and the ulna being at the pinky side. These two bones act as a stationary pivot point for those carpal bones that are in the hand. And at this point, we're only getting one axis of rotation. The rest of the rotation comes from the forearm. At the base of the hand, we have eight carpal bones, which for the rest of the video, we're just going to simplify together as one group. Then the majority of the palm is taken up by the metacarpals, with the fingers being made up by the phalanges. The first and largest phalange is about one half the size of the whole finger, with each one after that being about two thirds the size of the one prior. The bones of each finger are encircled by tendons that come from the forearm muscles. You'll see this on the surface at the knuckles and any time one of the fingers is flexed. You can see that on either side of the finger we're getting those tendons that are wrapping around. I use flatter shapes for the top of the finger because it's characterized mostly by the bones and the tendons that overlie it whereas the bottom of the finger has more muscle mass to it, so it gets a rounder shape. It's important to understand the underlying bones when you draw the hand in back view because they're very prominent on the surface. A few standouts are the styloid process of the ulna, and to a lesser degree, the radius. As far as muscles are concerned, the thumb side of the hand is dominated by the first dorsal interosseous muscle. 
Its action is to bring the thumb closer to the palm, and it's pretty bulky when it does so. A smaller muscle called adductor pollicis rests in front of it and helps do the same thing. On the pinky side, we can see the pinky abductor, which brings the pinky away from the hand. And a communal tendon from the extensor muscles on the forearm spans the back of the hand. Those are the tendons that become really prominent when you extend the fingers. When I go to do my final line work of the surface anatomy, I'm paying attention to the shadow shapes that all of the forms create, as well as their overlap. So when I draw that protrusion of the ulna at the wrist, those lines then carry over into the silhouette of the hand. You can see in this next drawing that when the thumb is brought closer to the palm, the dorsal interosseous muscle bulges. Those extensor tendons are pretty prominent towards the end of the hand, and I fade them out as I get closer to the wrist. You can use those planar sketches we were doing earlier to figure out which sides of the form are going to be cast into shadow. I personally like to keep it pretty simple, so in this case the light is coming from above, so all my downward facing planes are in shadow. The palm side of the hand is going to be defined more by the muscles on the hand than the bones. Just like we saw with the fingers, the top is going to be bonier, whereas the underside is going to be more muscular and round. There are two main muscle groups on the palm, that being the thenar eminence on the thumb side and the hypothenar eminence on the pinky side. The pinky side is taller and thinner, reaching to the top of the palm, with the thumb side being wider and shorter. At the wrist, you can see the tendons of those flexor muscles we talked about last time. Those tendons go down the forearm, through the carpal tunnel, and into the palm. You can see those tendons bulging anytime you flex the wrist or the fingers. On the thumb side, I like to show the tendons of the thenar eminence going into the finger and then being overlapped by the fatty pad. But there's a lot going on in the fingers, so sometimes it's helpful just to simplify them to their outer shape. A big factor in finding your style is figuring out what details you like to omit, and it takes a lot of experimentation. If the fingers are at all bent, you see that creasing that happens in the palm. Try to emphasize these organic shapes by either using wrapping lines or rendering to show its roundness. In this next sketch, the fingers are pushing against the thenar eminence, which makes it even more round and bulging. I also group the underside of these fingers into one shadow value. You can see that I connect my lines from the carpal tendons to the palm directly, which makes it feel as though these two forms are interlocking with each other. When we look at the thumb side of the hand, we can see that bulky first dorsal interosseous muscle, as well as the thenar eminence on the underside. There's a group of muscles known as the thumb extensors, which are on the latter portion of the forearm. Their tendons create this triangular depression on the wrist, as they span from the forearm all the way down to the thumb. If you look at the wrist of this hand that I'm drawing now, you can see a couple sets of lines. One that corresponds to the carpal tunnel tendons, and another set that corresponds to those thumb extensors that I just mentioned. 
I also like to exaggerate that plane shift that occurs at the thumb knuckle. I do that by exaggerating the sharpness of that shape and having it change in value. Another point that Bridgman tends to exaggerate is the metacarpal on the index finger. I think it adds to the contrast of shapes in the hand, and it also helps push that functionality. I like to think of the tissue that surrounds the thumb, almost like cloth, where it gets pushed and pulled depending on the position of the thumb. You can see in the hand on the top right, that as the thumb pulls towards the right, all that skin begins to fold up. On the pinky side of the hand, we can see that sharp styloid process of the ulna, which is another one of those landmarks that you can see prominently at the surface. In contrast to the thumb side, we only see one prominent group here on the pinky side, and that's the hypothenar eminence. The pisciform bone of the carpal group also has a bony protrusion that you can kind of see from the surface. I'll usually group it in with the hypothenar eminence, although it'll stand out just a bit more when you hyperextend your fingers. You can see in this sketch where the pinky is brought closer to the palm, that hypothenar eminence is flexed and pushing against that pisiform bone. All right, everyone, that's about it for this video. I'd like to take a moment just to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. If you're looking to build an online portfolio, consider using Squarespace. They have beautifully designed templates that have been crafted by Squarespace's world-class design team. Adding images into your website is as simple as dragging and dropping them from your desktop into your browser window. Any images hosted on Squarespace can be edited directly within your browser using Squarespace's built-in image editor crop, resize, rotate, adjust the brightness, and much more. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash moderndayjames to save 10% off on your first purchase. And be sure to use the coupon code moderndayjames. Thanks again for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it, please click like and subscribe with notifications on. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by heading to patreon.com slash moderndayjames. There we have many great perks, like access to Gumroads at a discounted price, group lessons, and one-on-one -on -one lessons. Take care, everybody, and I will see you in the next video.